today's today's guest is Bjarni Bauer from NAI Sophia Group in Shanghai, China. Welcome, Bjarni. Hi, hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a welcome to have. It's a pleasure to have you, and and it's a uh, a good night. I, I guess it's uh, what 11 p.m. in Shanghai and 7 a.m. here in uh, in in the, the vineyards of California, where I'm calling in from. Exactly. That's how it goes when we work globally. And we are NEI Global. Good. Well, let, let's start with the obvious question. And it's sort of like a bar question. You know, what's what's a guy like you doing in a place like this? You're you're German. You're living and working in Shanghai, China. How did this all develop? Did you start your commercial real estate career in, in Germany or did you start it in China? Very good question, you know, and somehow it just happens. Life happens, doesn't it? But it was always, I was always curious about China and I, it was somehow the, the desire for adventure, I think that got me there. And I was a bit in the real estate industry in Germany early on, just after uni. And then I got the opportunity to go to China for a year. And that year turned into two years and that two years into five. And now it's already almost 20 years that I'm here in Shanghai. And of course, I was lucky. I, I stumbled in a way into the commercial and industrial real estate here in China at a time when all the American and European manufacturers would set up factories, warehouses, distribution, they would set up shop, they would sell their goods, they would buy from China. So there was an enormous growth in that demand and there still is. So, so that is one of the reasons I've never left. Oh, good for you. Uh, and before I forget, <clears throat> I'm gonna put in a shameless plug for our friends at the Society of Industrial and Office Realtors. You're an SIOR. Uh, when did you get your designation? About four years ago, and it has helped a lot. I wasn't sure about it at the time, you know, how much this designation would be recognized in China, but having the designation and also having the access not only to all the 300 NAI global offices, but also the expertise and resources of the SIORs is of course a great benefit. And also for many of them, they have clients in China and we cover, we service China, China wide. So of course we can also help them and their clients. And that's of course also a nice thing to do. Excellent. And, and for the audience that doesn't know, NEI Global has uh, perhaps one of the highest concentrations of SIORs among its professionals. Um, and that's, it, it's, it can only be helpful. It's uh, the, the accreditation, the um, education, the additional network, it's all good. And it's a good group. So um, happy you're part of that as well. Um, why don't you, you, you referenced how you uh, got to China and started working there. And uh, oh, by the way, again, the audience knows uh, many of us kind of, I wouldn't say stumble into our careers in this industry, but we, we didn't choose it growing up. Uh, but, but a lot of us are working on changing that to make it an intentional career. So if you have an interest in that, contact me and we can, uh, we can have that conversation. But um, uh, since you referenced, uh, Bjarni, the uh, industrial work that you're doing, why don't you touch on uh, some of the services you provide in Shanghai? And a related question, are, are your services limited or restricted to Shanghai, or do you work in other parts of China? It's a big country. Sure. I mean, a lot of what we do is what we call occupier representation. So helping companies, multinational company, companies with their needs. They need to buy or rent office space buy or rent factory space, and we help them do that. And we do that all over China, but a lot of what we do is concentrated either here in Shanghai and the neighboring provinces, Jiangsu and Zhejiang, and the Beijing area, and a bit the south area, mm -hmm. Shenzhen, Guangzhou. So those areas is that those are the areas where we have a lot of the international companies, and many of them, they bought space earlier on, now they need bigger space. Some of them, they bought space, now they need to sell it, and now they're going into a sale and lease back or they're renting bigger facilities and so on. The office market is of course, in a way simple, but huge, you know. In Shanghai, we have about 300 commercial buildings and many of those are skyscrapers, similar in Beijing, similar in those other major cities. And then in some more, uh, more, yeah, in some of those markets which are further away, we work with local partners, but we basically cover China. Excellent. Uh, and, and you sort of referenced the, the number of, of office buildings. Um, again, I like to give the audience context. 
what is the uh, inventory? And I know you work in square meters. We can just do a simple multiplier of 10x, but uh, but in, in your primary market, Shanghai, what is the inventory sure. of industrial product and what, what about an office space? Well, in terms of office, we have about 14.5 million square meters. So that's about 150 million square feet just in Shanghai alone. In office. And in office. Okay. And industrial, I don't have a specific figures ready, but Shanghai used to be an area with a lot, with thousands and thousands of large mm. Fortune 500 companies and medium-sized companies having their factories. Now, of course, many of them are moving out of the city, moving into neighboring cities, but we're having a lot of inventory. And in Shanghai, a few years back, I would say just like three, four years back, the office space had an enormously high occupancy. Each year new towers came up like mushrooms, but they filled up right away. And we had occupancies like 93, 94% at times with almost no vacancy. And that also drove up, of course, the rentals very high. And then we doubled our office inventory over the past few years, about roughly five years. And now we have vacancies of about 20%. But given the current global situation and COVID and all of that, uh, having about 20% vacancy among such a, a large office supplies actually still low and the market very healthy. The office market, I would say the industrial market very hot, like it is almost everywhere around the globe. Mm -hmm. And even retail in China performing quite well. However, not for traditional shopping because that has all moved to e-commerce, but doing all those education and clubs and entertainment and food and beverage and hairdressers and dentists and so on. So even the retail space is doing actually quite well over here. Oh, very good. And in, in referencing off the office market, that's a big market. You said about 150 million square feet which um, in context, I live near San Francisco, which has maybe 80, 85 million square feet. Back in the 90s, when I went to work for a, a large national company, we won't reference them. Um, I, was, I was always amazed that San Francisco at the time had 60 million square feet of office space. And when I went to New York for the first time, they had 360 million square feet of office space, six times larger. So in context, it's, Shanghai is a big office market. Who, who are the, uh, the occupiers? I mean, here, again, in the, in the California Bay Area, it's largely driven by tech, obviously. Your larger uh, cities like London and, and New York, the financial services industries, what kind of occupiers dominate the uh, office market in Shanghai? Well, we have, in a way, a wider range of industries because Shanghai serves for many companies as their China headquarter or even as their Asia headquarter. So they may have factories all across the country and all across the globe, but this may be like a regional headquarter for their, for their overhead. And then we have, of course, all the professional services, the lawyers, the strategy consultants, the accountants, and so on. We have that. We have the financial industry. We have all the major banks from all across the globe, Asia, Europe, the US, you know, they, they all they all have a presence here and we have a tech sector. So all of that combined kind of fills up, fills up these buildings. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, one question again, audience uh, sensitive is, is fees and commissions structure, st structures vary by country. Uh, since commercial real estate is clearly a, a fee driven business, how are you compensated in China for lease and sale agreements? Well, good question. And simply put, our fees are much lower than in the Western world. I think in the US, the fees tend to be relatively high. In Europe, they're a little lower. In China, they're even much lower. They're also low in, in markets like Korea and Japan, as far as I know. So let's say for a sale, for an investment sale or a big industrial sale, a broker would often just get, a brokerage would just get 1% of the sale value instead of maybe two to three in Europe and three to four to five in the US. And similar on leases, when we do a five, or eight or 10 year lease, the broker's commission is often just one or two months in rent. So a relatively small proportion to the deal size. But then on the upside, deals here happen often and fast. Companies change 
grow, need bigger space. So uh, I remember from back in Frankfurt, uh, bigger companies, they would be in the same building for 10 or 20 years. And here they often move after just like five or six years because they need newer premises, nicer premises, bigger premises, all those things. So uh, simply put, we do more deals here and uh, the commission per each deal is a bit smaller. Okay, that's that's a good answer. And then related, actually, I hadn't thought of this uh, earlier when we prep for the uh, the podcast. Um, I would guess that there are fewer of you uh, working in country, uh, meaning uh, fewer commercial real estate service professionals. It's a pretty crowded field here in the United States. Um, is that is that a is that a fair assum- assumption and assessment, or is it a pretty competitive business still? It is still pretty competitive because the interesting thing is a country like China obviously has its own Chinese brokerage firms. It has all the American, Canadian, European brokerage firms having a presence here. It has all the Japanese, all the Korean international groups having a presence in the market. So actually, there is still quite a lot of competition over here. Um, I think we have at least as much competition as you would have in Europe. The U.S., I can't comment on. Could be that in the U.S. there's even more competition. It, it, it strike the question. It sounds like it's a regular old dog fight like it is for everybody else everywhere. So uh, good on you for competing. Sounds like you're doing a good job with it. Okay, I already asked you about, um, do you work in other cities in, in addition to Shanghai? Uh, but let's dig into uh, the Chinese economy and commercial real estate. The, the, uh, the, the Evergrande bankruptcy at the beginning of the year made uh, international news uh, there's there's rarely a silver lining in bankruptcy filings, but on your website, you have a blog post that, that goes back to March of 2021 that basically said you weren't surprised that it was coming. Uh, there, was, there were risk signals all over the place, red flags, um, and, it, and it's obviously the bankruptcy has happened. The, uh, you also reported that the government was at the time and still is still confident, the Chinese government, in the Chinese economy, despite the fact that uh, real estate accounts for about 25% of China's GDP. Um, What can you comment on about this? Well, that's very interesting because in fast growing economies, let's say like China, like India and so on, there is a lot of need. There's a lot of growth, apartments, office space, all kinds of real estate are being built. So the construction industry and the real estate industry take up a much bigger portion of the GDP of the country, you know, maybe in in Europe and the US it's 10 to 15% that this sector accounts for and in China it's more like 25 to 30 percent at the moment at some point that will fade out things go more into services and so on but right now it accounts for a lot and the interesting thing is the government the Chinese government has for a long time been wanting to get a bit more control over this wild and hard market because over the past few years let's say about the past 10 years, the Chinese GDP grew a lot, maybe something like quadrupled, but the real estate market grew even more and real estate prices grew in some some markets kind of out of control. So the government is saying, we wanna get this a bit under control in order to avoid a bubble. So more than a year ago, they already announced that there will be stricter regulations and developers, instead of needing 10% equity, needed 50% equity. And we at the time said, well, for groups like Evergrande and other major developers, that means they can't continue to exist the way they did. And about a year later, that happened. And it happened pretty much by design and by plan. And the government can at any moment loosen those loosening those restrictions and letting the market do again what it wants. So I'm not afraid at all for the Chinese real estate market or for the Chinese economy. Mm -hmm. But of course, some of the investors in very risky or relatively risky products related to these developers, they may lose some of their, they may lose some of their investments. Ah, interesting. Good, good answer. It, 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 for those of us that are uh, long, long in the tooth, as we say, or, or been in the business so long, it reminds me of the 1980s in the United States with the uh, savings and loan, um, you know, liberal lending policies, which led to a commercial real estate bubble and then a, a later collapse. And then the changes with the Resolution Trust Corporation, 
again, people that worked in the industry in the 80s and 90s will remember way back when this happened in America too. So it sounds like uh, China's getting its arms around um, fairly loose business practices because they want to prevent the bubble. So good, good for them. Good, good for you. Exactly. Uh, you, you, by the way, if for again for listeners that that aren't familiar with Bjarni and the uh, NEI Sophia Group, Bjarni hosts a fun vlog. It's called Crazy Buildings. So if you want to catch some of that, you might, might want to find how to how to get get a hold of his his vlog. Um, on your recent vlog, Crazy Buildings, Bjarni, you uh, talked about some some uh, really large buildings, um, interesting buildings. And you talked specifically about land use rights and how they're structured. Maybe you can touch on that a little bit and, and tell us about, about what's going on with land use rights in, uh, in, in Shanghai and China. Sure, I mean, that's very interesting. You know, China being a communist country, well, the baseline is nobody owns land. It's the country, it's the government, the country that owns everything. And since about the 90s, it became possible to buy, to purchase a land use right. So when one says over here, well, I bought a building or I bought a plot of land, one actually bought a land use right, L-U-R. And for a residential building, that's typically like 70 years. And nobody knows what happens after that in a way because it started in the 90s and now it's 2020, now it's 30 years down the road. So uh, people haven't figured out yet what exactly happens at the end of that, but the Chinese lawmaker, the government is working on clarifying that. Now for commercial, it is 40 years and for industrial, 50 years typically. There are exceptions and so on. Sometimes it's only 20 years, but often that's the way it's structured. And that, of course, factors also in in how one has to look at real estate, at the value. Like if, if a company owns an industrial property and only half of that initial 50 year period is left, definitely there is a, a depreciation. Definitely the value is, is impacted by that. I see. And, and then related, uh, so, you know, are there institutional owners of property in China? We hear in the States, of course, that uh, so much of, of China's state owned and sponsored. Uh, are, are there private owners? Are there institutional owners? Who, who does own what? They're, they're yeah. all here and you'd be surprised, you know, the amount of international money, the amount of foreign direct investment just keeps growing year after year. Even during the so-called trade war, it grew and it grew twofold. The companies invested more than before in setting up new manufacturing premises and so on, as well as the institutional money. So we have enormous amounts of capital from hedge funds, from pension funds and so on, from the US, from Canada, from Europe, flowing into China because it is regarded as a strong economy, and the returns tend to be quite attractive. So this seems to be that mix where big international money says, okay, we want to allocate at least a certain percentage of our portfolio and we want to be there. And then it goes into these typical, you know, sectors, office buildings, shopping malls, logistics buildings. Nowadays, also we start to see institutional money going into some standardized manufacturing buildings that's still in the early in, in its infancy, but logistics is a very hot sector. Well, I mean, the, the world knows China is, is the largest consumer market in the world. Um, there's a lot of people, so that, that drives everything, I, I, I presume. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so the 800 uh, pound gorilla in the room is since the pandemic, uh, there's been a lot of talk in North America about reshoring our logistics supply chains and bringing manufacturing back. Of course, China has been called the world's factory. Um, and you alluded to all the investment that's that's been coming to China. Is, is there still evidence? Is there any evidence of a pullback in manufacturing in China or the opposite? Is there still companies coming to create plants and, and build facilities in China? Well, if something is going out, it's probably going out more quietly. So we may not even be aware of it, but I can say, and the figures speak to that in terms of occupancy, in, in terms of foreign direct investments, so there's more coming in than going out for sure. And the interesting thing is that China, which uh, the China that most people have in their minds is the China of 20, 30 years ago, 
But China has developed in 20, 30 years as much as maybe other countries uh, do in 50 or 100 years. So it's a very different, like if you look at, for example, Tim Cook of, of Apple said five years ago, we are producing and we are big in China because of the large amount of engineers, the large amount of coders, programmers, and so on. The, the, the talent pool, that intersection of craftsmanship that people can manufacture nice products like Apple products, and also have the scale and also have all the technology. So for a lot of companies, they were actually surprised at how expensive nowadays it is to produce in China. And there can certainly be reasons to produce in markets closer to home, especially if it's highly automized. But overall, we see still more production coming to China than, than going out of it. Excellent. All right, well, we're, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up. We're 25 minutes in or so. Um, what, what property related question have I not asked you that you think listeners would be, uh, would, would wanna learn? And, and also what do you expect the real estate sector? How do you expect it to perform for the balance of 2022? Well, uh, you, you ask all the right questions, so not much more that I can think of. Something that sometimes people are interested in and also quite shocked about is the cost of an apartment, a relatively humble, simple apartment here in, in Shanghai. If you go, and I'm now not talking about riverfront or anything, I'm talking about relatively downtown, simple, two-bedroom, 1,000 square feet apartment, what that cost is, because that costs you about 2 million US dollars. And given the average person's income, that make prices a, a huge portion of the population out of the market. And another part of the population got rich by owning these apartments from 10, 20 years ago, when they cost like 10% of what they cost today, or even less than that. So that is also one of the reasons why the government says, okay, we have to step in and somehow control this relatively crazy market. And uh, other than that, um, what, what was the second part of the question? Sorry, you said, how what, you, what, you answer, ask? How, what do you, how do you expect the commercial real estate markets to perform for the balance of 2022? Right, so the government has right now started to loosen a bit some of those restrictions. So they wanna avoid that uh, a whole bunch of additional developers go bankrupt. So I think this will stabilize. And then once it has stabilized, they will start to introduce a property tax and because right now there's very little tax on properties over here. And that will then intertwine with that earlier topic of, okay, what happens at the end of my 50 years? What might happen is that's one guess is, well, you're allowed to keep it, but you, start, you, you have to start paying relatively high taxes. And that's in a way a fair model, I would guess. Wow, the, the, the apartment cost is frankly shocking. I mean, it, if, if uh, we hear, certainly in New York and California, the high cost of housing, but it, it seems to pale in comparison to uh, that kind of apartment pricing in Shanghai. The last question, Bjarni, the uh, NEI uh, Global, how, how can professionals help you? How can you help them? You know, this is a commercial real estate um, network enterprise and we're all looking for new business. Uh, what do you say to our audience? What you're looking for, how can you help them? How can you, they help you? Well, we're always happy to be in contact and we have a lot of success helping brokers from Europe, from the US that have clients in, and they're helping them in their home market. And there was some companies, they have something in China and we are very happy to help and support there. It of course goes both ways, but we are representing usually American and European companies with their needs over here. Sometimes we even like triangle, you know, we help them in the US in Europe and in Asia. So, so that's, that's uh, of course, what we like to do more and more of. Well, we love a trifecta, as we say. Well, um, Bjarni Bauer, NEI Sophia Group in Shanghai, China, thank you so much for this podcast uh, episode. Um, good day, everybody. Thank you.